when you read those passages, you can clearly see this is not a subjective test, test from Jesus. Jesus is saying, look, kill me and I'll, ri I'll rise from the dead three days later. So, yeah, what Jesus was talking about was serious. It was a serious test. And now if Jesus did rise from the dead, mm. then this confirms that the message he was preaching was true. Mm. So, you know, he gives his life for the sins of mankind. And he shows his authority by rising from the dead. Mm. Hello and welcome to Postcards from Antioch. I'm Oz and going to be hosting the session today and we have Rob with us as well. We're going to be thinking about the resurrection and like all of our series uh, which focus on teaching and training and equipping ourselves for how to live as Christians and to answer questions of the Bible. We're going to be diving into this topic and asking some really relevant questions because Easter is upon us. So um, really good to have you with us today Rob. I wonder, first of all, if you could just introduce yourself and uh, maybe I could, I could kick off with Easter's coming. Have you bought your Easter egg yet? Or even if you haven't, what is your favourite chocolate Easter egg? Yeah. Hi, first of all, um, thanks for having me on here. It's, uh, it's great to be invited. So um, I'm really looking forward to the, uh, to the discussion. Um, with respect to Easter, I haven't even started with Easter egg shopping, so I've got nothing planned um, with respect to that. What's my favourite egg? It's a. I'm torn. I've always been. I'm going to say marathon for the older people out oh, wow, there. Yeah. Because I I do like a Snickers. So I like the chocolates and the nuts with it. So if I had to go for any Easter egg, it would probably be uh, yeah be a Snickers. Yeah. I actually get more excited about the bar of chocolate than the yeah, actual yeah. egg because yeah, it's hollow. Absolutely. It's always disappointing. And there we go. Yeah, they cut back. I think on the egg and actually yeah. the, the the bar itself is always the. Uh, Exactly. The better prize, I think. I'm known in my family to delay eating it by weeks, a month or two sometimes, much to the annoyance of my kids and wife, um, just partly because I want to wait for the right moment. <laughs> but theirs are gone within a day or two. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it's kind of quite amusing. But anyway, yeah. there we go. Chocolate and eggs. Um, tell us a bit about yourself, Rob. What do you do? How, uh, how come you're involved in this today? Yeah, so uh, I mean give you a bit of background I I'm, I haven't been a Christian all of my life um I was baptized uh 2 years ago kind this coming August um I have to say it was it was an amazing experience um you know to to dedicate and to give my life to to Christ was the best decision I ever made um and it's something that I've I've never looked back on since mm -hmm. since I've done that um but before I you know before I was a Christian I, I wouldn't say I I yeah I wouldn't have said I was an atheist probably more on the sort of agnostic um, spectrum. Um, but the, the reality of it is I didn't give religion much thought. Um, I, you know, when I was younger, I did have exposure to the church. Um, I was uh, a choir boy to start off with, but as uh, progressively as my voice got worse, uh, they pushed me on to become an altar boy, um, which was sort of more influence from, from my mother. But... You know, uh, in a nutshell, I never took religion seriously. I think by about the age of 12, um, I actually fell away from the church completely. And I carried on with, with the passion of, of football that was in sport. That was my big sort of drive, uh, what I lived for as a, as a teenager and young adult. Um, and then when I left school and, and went to work, that was my, my real focus. And um my I guess the, the sort of where the tables turned and where it changed was when I met my wife Lauren um now Lauren has always been a Christian all her life she grew up as in a, in a Christian family and I guess that as we got to know each other more it, it challenged my perspective on life and and it made me think about a worldview um and mm. I guess that's when I began to look at you know is there a God out there? And, and that sort of led to, to sort of further questions, you know, does God exist? You know, did Jesus rise from the dead? And that was where I was sort of introduced to apologetics. Um, and that's something that you've done a lot of reading and thinking about now, isn't it? It's yeah. Formed yeah. your faith in a way by giving it a foundation. And um, some people really enjoy thinking and wrestling with those questions and others maybe have those questions, but don't get near fully understanding them so it's a passion of yours yeah yeah absolutely it it 
got me over the line. I think yeah. there was a lot of questions that I had, which I really struggled with to, to kind of get my head around. And I think apologetics is just a, it's a really useful resource that, that we can, mm. um, that we can use in, in just trying to help us understand truth. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I looked into topics within the, you know, the sort of sciences. So tried to understand the theories and philosophies mm. of, you know, creation and, and the universe and how it all come about. Um, I looked at, you know, evolution and, and origins of life and, you know, the, the sort of arguments for intelligent design. And it was all really interesting, but you know, quite mind boggling at times. But, it, you know, that s starting off with that, it kind of led me uh, to sort of trying to understand, you know, the character of Jesus, uh, whether he was who he claimed to be. Um, and we can do that, I guess, by reviewing scriptures. But, you know, there are lots of good uh, scholars out there. Um, which provide you know, good resources that can help us understand that character and, you know, those claims of whether he did really rise from the dead. So, mm. yeah, um, I mean, that that did lead me to, to try and find a, a conclusion, you know, trying to understand my worldview and, you know, what is the most plausible explanation for this? And, yeah. you know, I came to the conclusion that you know, Christianity was true. Great. Wow. OK, so that's good because we're looking at the claims of Christianity uh, and particularly the resurrection um so easter is upon us we're recording this and it's about 10 days nearly to, just under two weeks to, to easter easter weekend um it'd be really interesting to know why as well as thinking about jesus death jesus resurrection is a really important topic for the church to consider and be informed in but also for society um, so why, why do you think this is important for us to run a bonus episode? We're not due to record our series five uh, and release it till September, but we've planned this bonus episode. So why are we doing this? Yeah, well, I'll touch on um, what you mentioned there when, you know, we, I think when we view society today, um, probably not much has changed in respects to the challenges that we face as Christians. I think we still come across the same sort of questions and objections. And I'm actually quite encouraged to hear people standing up for the gospel message and um, they're still doing that and they're actually not giving in to the pressures of society i i think when you know what is slightly discouraging um recently is that you know we've seen christianity have quite a sharp decline and i think since 2011 it's just plummeted down into people who are actually identifying as christians and i think that's now fallen below 50 percent yeah, so that's right. you know whilst it is still the most common religion um we kind of view the UK or the country overall is is probably seen more now as, as a more of a secular nation. So why I think it's important, well, I think it's important to provide information on why we have good reasons to believe that Christianity is true. Mm. Um, now, people may ask, why is truth important? Why should we even worry um, if Christianity is true? And I think the answer to that is, is pretty simple. Um, I think by studying and understanding the authenticity of Jesus's resurrection and, and and if we objectively weigh up the evidence and to sort of see that it is at least plausible to be true then I think that's an extremely mm. important um I think C.S. Lewis gets this absolutely spot on when he, when he states it in his book Mere Christianity he says if Christianity is true then is this then is this not the most important question we should all be asking or investigating for ourselves mm. And so, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, that, that, that's really helpful, isn't it? It's a question that whether you're in church or not, however you, you've been brought up, like myself or, or Lauren, your wife, or mm. differently yourself, with less or a different input, um, it's a question that needs consideration. So this is, this is really seeking to do that, isn't it? It's to help us think, is this something we just read in the Bible and have to accept at face value? Or, or is there a way of understanding the credibility of that and giving evidence to an event that is transformative and has led to a religion lasting over 2,000 years and having an impact globally? So Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I think it, it is important, I think, because if, if Jesus is who he claims to be and if there is eternal life, you know, if Jesus is claiming, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, so if he's offering eternal life, then the choices that we make in this life, well, mm. you know, that will be a result of A, where we spend it, mm. um, but also B, what that experience is going to be like for eternal life. Yeah. So it's an extremely important question to, 
It's, it's not an everyday bit. claim, is it? This no, is a whole this is different yeah. category. Yeah. It's not a, yeah, I'll go for a marathon or Snickers chocolate Easter egg. It's yeah. a life transforming um, concept that is a person that could be known now and forever. So, okay. Yeah. How are we going to address this? How are we going to work through this theme um, as we as we start off? Yeah. So how are we going to look at this big topic? It's huge, isn't it? So, mm. you know, where do we start? So, I mean, this is the key question as to whether Christianity is true. So uh, when I've reviewed re the resurrection for Jesus, and I've, I've done that for some time, um, you know, I've read books, I've used resources from from historical uh, scholars, uh, I've studied the evidence that they've provided. But I think the key when you do that is just to try and be objective. Um the one thing that I struggle with is not letting your biases get in the way. And mm. I think it, we probably all struggle with that to a certain degree. So I tried to ad adopt a, a slightly different approach and, and maybe not necessarily look at what I believe, but actually what I can prove. Yeah. So um, and and what we can prove should determine uh, any sort of evidence that's presented to us. So um, I guess the next point is, well, what direction do we take with that? So. I think if anyone is, is trying to understand the resurrection, then the best place to start is probably trying to understand the main facts. So we look at, you know, the evidence for Jesus's death or the empty tomb or, you know, the postmodern, uh, sorry, postmortem appearances. Mm. Um, you know, those are important areas to understand. And uh, you touched on this with the big question, small answers a couple of years yeah. ago, and really mm. useful. And I think if for anyone that hasn't looked at that, that's a really good mm. place to start. But what I feel can complement that is, uh, or complement the main facts on the resurrection, is actually reviewing the historical sources where we find those. Mm. So what I would firstly do is probably look at the sources within the Bible. So as we know, the Bible is a, is a book of antiquity, um, arguably the most uh, reliable history book that we have on record. It's proven to be more historically and archaeologically accurate than any other ancient book that we possess so you know for example if we look at the, the dead sea scrolls you know they provide our oldest copies of almost all the old testament um and that actually confirms the reliability of the actual transmission process down as well so mm. um you know if we, so we've got the bible as, as one source that we would always use we can also look at external sources when we look at this so um, you know, you can look at those sources which aren't necessarily linked to Christianity. So that could be someone like Josephus, uh, who's a Jewish historian, or Tacitus, the, the Roman historian. So I'm probably not going to touch too much on those because um, I think due to time, we probably wouldn't be able to sure. go into all that sort of detail. Yeah. But it is they are a good source. They are you know good to review because they talk a lot about events that happen within the first mm. century. And also the sort of rise and origin of, of Christianity as well. Mm. So, um, so yeah, we have Bible, uh, the Bible sources. We have uh, outside sources or external sources. We can also look at corroborating sources as well. So something that I've learned from this is is uh, the actual the apostles themselves had disciples. Uh, who would have thought? Mm. Um, but <clears throat> we know that Peter had a a disciple known as Clement of Rome, and John also had a disciple called Polycarp. So these are good corroborating uh, sources and probably something that I'll touch on a bit okay. later on a few other questions. But, so I think just to summarise, we, we probably won't be look, putting all the focus on the main facts, but instead sort of looking at the sources of where those facts come and from. And therefore, if the sources are reliable, we can move on and, and understand why often the facts that jump to immediately, the empty tomb and the first-hand witnesses and all the rest, eyewitnesses, mm. can be believed. because. Yeah actually they're coming from a reliable source okay yeah. so by that do you mean uh, matthew mark luke and john um what 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 are you what are you talking about when you talk about the those sources yes so yeah we've got the gospel sources of course um probably the the four main books that people will always refer to are the gospels um so yeah we can look at those we've got other outside sources uh, sorry other sources within those as well so you've got paul the apostle and the epistles so sure. those are the type of books that yes we yeah. would we would probably yeah. look at yeah. with respect to that okay great well shall we see how they can help us reach um a, an understanding of whether the resurrection is credible whether it's mm. um yeah something that we can call true and um put faith in believing so what's the, what's the first step on that journey 
Yeah, so yeah, really good question. Um, yeah, the first step would be probably to look at what is the most earliest source, I guess yeah. we would look at. Um, what historians will generally look at is they look to see uh, if those sources, are, how early are those sources. They look for uh, testimony, so they may look for someone that is unsympathetic towards the event, someone that is um, hostile, maybe hostile eyewitness. Mm. So as you can kind of see, that kind of fits mm. within Paul's uh, yeah. situation as, a, as an eyewitness, but also someone that was a persecutor of, of Christianity yeah. as well. So that's probably where we could potentially look at, um, mm. you know, looking at those earlier sources, but also not taking away the Gospels as well. Yeah, that is obviously yeah. uh, another source that we can look at. Yeah. OK, so um, have you got any examples of passages that might be helpful from one of the Gospels? And then we'll think about the Gospel and then we'll move to St. Paul. Yeah, so we can all, we can look at John, uh, John 2, uh, verses 18 to 22. Are you happy to read? Yep, that if you do. Yep. got that there. John chapter 2. As I think this passage here really um, focuses on on what Jesus is claiming and, and the resurrection. Yeah. Okay, John chapter 2, verse 18 to 22 says, The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus Jesus had spoken. Yeah, great. So when you read those passages, you can clearly see this is not a subjective test, test from Jesus. Jesus is saying, look, kill me and I'll, ri- I'll rise from the dead three days later. So, yeah, what Jesus was talking about was serious. It was a serious test. And now if jesus did rise from the dead Mm. then this confirms that the message he was preaching was true Mm. so you know he gives his life for the sins of mankind and he shows his authority by rising from the dead Mm. so whilst we say that (laughs) i guess the other thing is that that really doesn't mean anything to us until we actually truly believe that that jesus actually did rise from the dead Mm. but but that's you know that's a good passage that can, that can yeah that's like that. an, in, a claim internally from scripture the gospels there to say yeah. how his disciples came to understand what he's he had meant by that mm. um and that specific link to the resurrection is is quite clear isn't it they recalled what he had said so okay yeah so um how do we know that the resurrection actually happened it was a long time ago is this where we start thinking about paul or what what helps us move from the disciples claiming that they recalled that Jesus had said one thing and then actually did it to believing it today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I hear this from a lot of people. I hear that, uh, you know, well, we can't, you know, resurrection, we can't know if it ever happened. You know, it's 2000 years ago. You know, how can we know? It's a common objection. Um, I actually hear it a lot during debates. As, you know, people bring that up about the time frame. Um, and, you know, I would agree. We we don't see people rising from the dead. We don't see that in a daily occurrence. It doesn't happen weekly. Mm. We don't get Uncle Joe coming back asking for his inheritance money because he's risen back. So, you know, it's not it, it. The idea of a resurrection is difficult for people to comprehend, and I think that is why we have quite a big objection to it. But, you know, to say how are we supposed to know if it actually really did happen when the event was two thousand years ago? Well. I would disagree with anyone that suggests that we can't know. You know, I think we can trust historical evidence. Um, We have good historical sources, all of which are close to the event itself. So I think what is key is that because we have good and reliable sources, it's important to remember that good history doesn't become bad just because of that lapse of time. Mm, Okay. So it's really important to to, to remember that. So time doesn't um, unvalidate what, the, his, the the reliability of something essentially no it doesn't I and mean, if we can confirm that those sources are mm. within a, a you know a close you know how you def- define close is you know is down to the historians i guess mm. but if we if we know that the, that the time is is relatively close to the event itself then we've got good reasons to believe that that source is reliable 
Yeah. You know, just because it's 2,000 years old doesn't mean it's an unreliable source. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we have good reasons to believe that, that the sources we have, especially within the Bible, are, mm. are reliable. Yeah. So John was known to be one of Jesus' closest disciples. Um, Peter, who, who spoke with Mark, who recorded possibly the earliest um, gospel, is another, you know, he would definitely say something pro what Jesus had said at his time and then you've got um matthew another disciple and then luke greek but they're all basically on the same team yeah you're right some sources probably we would say that the likes of uh, of matthew and john being close to jesus being first-hand eyewitnesses we would probably say that those sources are you know what we would class as you know a pack of cards would class them as kings wouldn't they yeah um we have Mark. Yes, he got his eye, his, his information as an eyewitness of Peter. So maybe what we class as second hand. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, we have to sign him as a queen, like you said earlier. Uh, and then we have Luke. Um. Now, what I would say about Luke is, it can be viewed as being a little ambiguous. It, you know, with the information that Luke uh, gathers for his gospel, it's difficult to know whether his information is from an eyewitness, or those who knew the eyewitnesses. It doesn't actually clearly state it, mm. but, you know, we still know that that is a reliable source. Historical scholars will all say that Luke is a reliable source. The information he has in there is credible mm. um, and it does match a lot with what the, the other gospels say as well. So, but if Jesus is his death and his resurrection was between 30, 33 AD now, and most scholars will say that the, I'd say the majority of scholars will say that the gospels were written within all within the first century so you know at worst we're looking at narratives that were written all within sort of 70 years yeah within the events which in historically speaking mm. is extremely close yeah yeah when other historical pieces of writing might have had several hundred years uh, <laughs> distance at, at the very best and up to a thousand years at the worst so yeah, yeah it, it, it's um close time period so that's that's the gospels with sort of Anything else on the Gospels before we think about Paul? You've mentioned Paul as being a source to go to as well. Yeah, and I'll probably touch on why I use Paul more so than the Gospels for this. And um, whilst I still think the Gospels are a reliable source, what I would concede is they do come with challenges. Um, I think, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, I think the Gospels are a great source, but they face a lot of challenges from historical scholars. Um, when I read some uh, articles from Gary Habermas, who's a New Testament scholar, now he's studied over 4,000 articles on the resurrection since the 60s up mm -hmm. to the present day. Quite a bit of reading. <laughs> yeah, just a tad. Um, and he confirmed actually the major objection to, uh, to the resurrection was the differences within the gospel. That was yes, what he Yes, because they've got one of them has one angel, another two, one other has an earthquake the other doesn't there's all these details is that what you're referring to or yeah, different points yeah. than that yeah some people would argue that when we look at mark's gospel for example it finishes straight there's no you know they find him at the, uh, they find uh the angel at the uh at the tomb and then it kind of just it ends abruptly and i think what we see with matthew there's a sort of evolved scripture where we start seeing more and more of the events the ascension of of jesus and, and the great commission and and i think that's where some people come a bit more critical with the gospels right um now i'm of the view that i think mark's gospel got lost now i'm not i don't you know i don't know if everyone agrees with me on that one but i, I just find when i read it i kind of get there and think ah there's there's more to it there must be so i i'm i've come to the review um that i i think we we don't have the full the full gospel but I think what we do know from the Gospels, um, we know that the authors were interested in history. Mm. Uh, you know, they were going to report historical events. But the challenge that historians have is that it's not actually knowing the integrity of what they're reporting. And mm. I think that's where the stumbling block goes. So that is where critical scholars will start questioning the, the reliability of the Gospels. And I, I guess because there's so many challenges like this that we could end up getting into. Um, I feel like we, we'd end up going off topic. Sure. So we start looking at the Gospels, yeah. reliability. And I think, well, rather than taking us away from the actual major mm. issue, which is well, what happened to Jesus, instead of putting that focus in the Gospel accounts, I think we can use other reliable sources 
which point towards the, the, the resurrection, i.e. the epistles of Paul. Yeah, so in a way they back up the Gospels and are a different source, essentially, with different author yeah. in part. Um, so how, how should we look at some of Paul's writings? He's written the majority of the New Testament letters. Yeah, so I think it's, in my view, it's the best available source, I think. And the, and the reason for that um, is, well, Paul claims to be an eyewitness, um, and we see that that's in, in the book of Acts. Um, he wasn't a follower of Christ at the time of his ministry. He was a, a persecutor of the church. Yep. You know, he was arresting, imprisoning Christians. Mm -hmm. He consented to their execution. Um, and whilst actually he was carrying out these activities, he he came across this experience of the risen Lord who, who appeared to him. Mm. And this radically changed his life. It radically changed his life from a, a persecutor of Christians actually to one of his mo one of the most able defenders. Yeah. So, uh, and, you know, a few decades later, he was actually executed for, for the beliefs outside of Rome. So I think he's, you know, when we take into account what historians look for, mm. when, when I touched on earlier, they look at you know eyewitnesses that are unsympathetic towards the event, sure. ones that are hostile. Uh, we can see this within Paul, so we I kind of see him as a as a really reliable source and one that kind of fits mm. that that mold. Yeah, he was on the opposing team exactly, and he yeah. changed teams. And what led to that, which didn't um, lead to a big salary or great career change or no. great reputation. In fact, quite the opposite. <laughs> Yeah, exactly that. You know, he had it. He had it all as a, as a yeah. Pharisee. You know, yeah. he was had a, you know high up in the Sanhedrin. Was probably going places. So to totally put that to one side and mm. be uh, beaten, whipped, stoned, shipwrecked, mm. he he went through all of that. So you kind of feel he has to be a credible source. Mm. He he must have believed, you know, truly believed mm. what he was doing here. So that's so you you built a bit of a framework there for why we can look at Paul, the Apostle Paul, and see. A reliable source an unlikely source but actually even more um reliability in, in line with the, the gospels are there any writings particularly that are helpful does he talk about the resurrection much has he got an advanced theology of that what what do we find yeah so when we look at paul's epistles we know there are 13 letters of the paul of, of, of 13 letters of paul within mm. the new testament yeah. okay so seven of these are, are undisputed yeah so it's unanimous from historical scholars that you know whether they're atheist or conservative yeah. they confirm paul wrote seven of those letters and that's uh, you know romans one and two corinthians one thessalonians phil lyman galatians and philippians they're sure. the seven books that you know they are completely undisputed if we look at two of the 13 letters which are hotly disputed so we've got uh, colossians and two thessalonians where there's a little bit of controversy onto whether mm. people believe that. I'd still say the slight majority believe they are written mm. by Paul. Um, and then we have the remainder ones where most scholars will say that, that Paul's not the author of the books. But, you know, that's not to say that he isn't, but that's the majority view that's yeah. held today. So what I try to do is just focus on those seven letters because yeah. it's unanimous. There's no argument there. Mm -hmm. We feel that, that you know, we can use those letters to, to actually build a really good case and, they do obtain a lot of excellent data. So when we're talking about the resurrection and how naturally with those letters, we can go right back and actually establish what the original apostles were preaching. Mm. So okay. it's, yeah. Wow. That's, that's yeah. And that, that, that's the kind of evidence that makes you go, okay, this, this has got some weight. Yeah. yeah. Have you got any examples of that? Yeah. So when we look at uh, Galatians or, or, or 1 Corinthians, uh, you know, Galatians is arguably uh, one of the first letters of Paul. Um, the majority of historians agree that the letter was written within 25 years of his ministry. OK. Um, so, you know, again, in historical terms, that really is close, um, a really close timeline. Um, but another interesting fact was that Paul knew the Jerusalem apostles. Um, he says in chap chapter one of Galatians that three years after his conversion, he went up to Jerusalem. He met with Peter, the lead apostle. He saw James, the brother of Jesus. And he goes on in chapter two and he says 14 years later, he returns to Jerusalem and he gets before the pillars of the church. That's Peter, James and John. And he ran the gospel message. He had been preaching to the Gentiles to make sure he was preaching what they were preaching. Wow. Okay. So. 
you know, he then comes back and actually confirms that they came back and added nothing more to what he was saying and they offered him the right hand of fellowship. Mm. So, you know, those passages are really important and they contain really vital information um, with respects to, to Jesus' resurrection. And I'll come on to that again in a minute because <clears throat> I can probably hear what people are thinking. They're saying, well, you know, what if Paul was lying? Because there is always that, that, that question. And, and I think that's a reasonable question to ask. And if Paul is lying, what we can do is actually we can look at those corroborating sources that we spoke about earlier. So we have Clement of Rome, the disciple of Peter. And now in his writings, he places Paul on par with Peter. So in his first epistle to the Corinthians, he calls him the blessed Paul. Mm-hmm. So, and that letter that Clement of Rome uh, wrote um, is actually one of the earliest documents outside of the New Testament, and mm. scholars date that probably to around 65, 70 AD. So yeah. again, mm. very close. Yeah. And then you've got Polycarp. <clears throat> it's a wonderful name, that. It is, isn't it? <laughs> um, he was a disciple. Sounds like John... a, a group of fish or something, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always think that carp, isn't it? Polycarp, yeah. Um, yeah, he's a disciple of John, and, and he, uh, he states in his epistle to the Philippians, and I've got it here, he says, um, none can replicate the wisdom of the blessed and glorious Paul. Uh, when he was with you, he accurately and reliably taught the word of truth to those who were there at the time. And when he was absent, he wrote you letters. If you carefully peer into them, you'll be able to be built up in the faith that was given to you. So Polycarp mm, stating this, he's saying, look, Paul accurately and reliably told you the message. He told you the truth. And elsewhere in his letters to the Philippians, he refers to Paul's letters and describes them as the sacred scriptures. So, wow. you know, this is not the sort of thing you would expect to to read if, if Paul was teaching heresy or if no. he was, you know, teaching opposite to what the gospel message was being preached. So I, I think from from using those corroborating sources, we can be confident that, that Paul was telling the truth. Yeah, that's really helpful, isn't it? And within a- the book of Acts, Luke's second um, book in the New Testament, we we read of Paul and interacting with Peter and the Jerusalem leaders and um, dialoguing and being sent out and some of the uh, Ch- Ch- Jerusalem church leaders heading out to affirm what Paul had been doing. So, yeah, th- th- there seems to be a mutual partnership, a unity, same gospel and therefore reference to the resurrection as a part of that gospel mm. um, not just by the apostles but as you say the, the early fathers of the church yeah um yeah. and actually the, the the strongest evidence that we have from these epistles is actually the oral formula yes so you know the oral tradition was you know that was used as a form of communication for you know for the jewish people mm. throughout you know the whole of history um and i think if we can establish within those letters of paul um we can know what was being said was being circulated before he put it in his letters yeah then we can date that authenticity of the resurrection even closer if, does that okay. make sense yes i think so just yeah. go over it one more time so for yeah our listeners and me yeah <laughs> so if we can establish uh within the letters written by paul um that there's oral tradition then we know that what was being said uh, was being circulated before the letters were written so that dates the authenticity of the resurrection even closer to the actual event okay, itself. Okay, so whilst the see. letter um, has got a certain date, the oral tradition demonstrates an earlier date. Correct. Because it was a communicating of yeah. the gospel, the resurrection, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, you know, uh, and we know that the, 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 the strongest uh, oral tradition we have is the creed, yeah? So, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and... In this chapter, we see that Paul begins by saying, you know, um, if we want to refer to it, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Mm -hmm. he says, I want to remind you of the gospel message I preached to you. So the first thing we can take from this is that Paul is confirming that that this is his gospel message. You know, uh, you know, I want to remind you of that gospel message I preached to you. So we know that Corinthians chapter 15 is the earliest reference to Jesus's resurrection in the Mm. New Testament. And we know that Paul is confirming that this is his gospel message. Now, if we refer back to Galatians, we know in chapter two, we see that that Paul runs that gospel message by the disciples. Mm. So he runs it by Peter, he runs it by James and John. Mm. And he's checking that his message was correct. 
you know, he confirms they certified that he was preaching the same message they were preaching. Mm. So you can see why I was referring to Galatians 2 yeah. earlier. Yeah, helpful. So here what we know is, is what Paul is preaching in his gospel is the same as what the original apostles were preaching. And if we go back to, to 1 Corinthians again, we go to verse 3, and he says here, he says, For what I received, I passed on to you. So when Paul is saying, you know, delivered or, or passed on, uh, depending on what translation you're looking at, um, he's stating and reminding them of the gospel message that he preached in the original. Mm. Um, it, you know, this passage that he's talking about, it, it's all past tense. Yes. Mm. So I guess the question that that would raise is when did Paul give them this gospel message? Mm. So, and if we look at it logically, we'd probably say, well, when he established the church in Corinth, which was probably around 51 AD. Yeah. So again, if Jesus died 30, 33 AD, then so we're looking around 18 to, to 21 mm. years uh, after the crucifixion so again this is really really yeah. close short testimony to the event so yeah yeah and we know that that one corinthians w was written around 55 56 ad so we know that people in corinth know he's telling mm. the truth because you know they know that he delivered it to them mm. yeah so we can assert that paul is delivering this oral tradition to corinth in 51 ad we know the information was received prior to 51 AD and Paul confirms this when he says for what I received. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got yeah. what I delivered to you, but for what I received, the sticky point is we don't know when he received it. <laughs> so, no. but we know that if he's delivering it in 51 AD, we know that he's received it before then. Yes. Is this all making sense? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's good. So actually as we read these scriptures and piece together the events in a bit of a chronology, we're getting an earlier date of a gospel that was circulated orally yeah um and a part of people's lived experience within two decades of the resurrection of jesus this is where it gets even better <clears throat> so when i researched this because i was i mean i had goosebumps when i read this I right i'm sad. waiting for this this is, this is gonna be good I isn't am, it right. i can tell yeah so when i yeah when i researched this um we have critical scholars now i mentioned the word critical um, such as Gert Ludemann, who's a German historian, yep, uh, um, Robert yeah. Funk, and they both acknowledge that we can be confident that this oral tradition goes back one to three years after the crucifixion. Right. And this yeah. is coming from critical scholars, not Christians, wow. it's critical scholars are saying one to three years. James Dunn yep. goes even further, and he said we can be confident that this oral tradition that Paul is reciting can go back as six months after the crucifixion How does it get to six months that's incredible no idea yeah uh, you know but it is possible to think that yeah. you know that these timelines are correct i mean this is coming from critical scholars not sure you know not sure. um not christians or christian theologians this is all critical so you know and uh, you know it's, it's just i mean like i said i got goosebumps when i was i was reading that sort of thing so um that's how sad i am <laughs> well i'm sure some of our <laughs> listeners are right now um but no i think i think that that sort of paints the picture picture strongly doesn't it mm. that this oral tradition was known respected um a normalized experience of communicating facts um not just make-believe stories or legends actual events in the lives of living memory which then got to the point of being um written and then copied and they're the manuscripts that we're reading today in the current form of uh new testaments yeah and and do you know what even if we don't know that exact timeline i think what we can be sure about is that we know it was prior to 51 ad because we know that he was delivering to the mm. the, the, the corinthian or corinth people of corinth this message and we know that it would have been established before then mm. you know, from what i received so mm. you know i, I think um I, I looked at a biblical scholar called ff F. bruce and um he makes a really valid point on this he says it it uh, i'll sort of paraphrase it but it's no mere coincidence that within this oral tradition paul mentions specifically by name peter and james to whom jesus appeared mm. um and if we remember in galatians 1 paul spent 15 days with peter and he saw james as the brother of jesus and in Galatians 2, he meets both Peter and Jesus again. So that probably could be where he received that information. So mm, may well have been. This is, yes. yeah. So what we've done is deep dive a little bit into something of Paul as an apostle, um, past persecutor, now preacher, apostle. And 
even stronger source as you've described than possibly some of the first things that we would jump to which would be the gospels themselves mm. so you, you've talked about peter and john being kings going back to your uh, analogy or metaphor um and uh, was it mark maybe a queen and yeah you you implied luke could have been a jack what we're talking about paul being an ace card absolutely right. yeah i think when you look at, at the uh the earliest earliest source that we have we would we would most certainly say it was paul yeah. um we look at his his uh you know, persecutor of the church. He claimed to be an eyewitness from from what he saw of the risen risen Jesus, and yeah, he, I mean, all of these uh, uh, all of these things that we're mentioning here make him mm. probably the most reliable source that we have. Mm. It, you know, I, in my view, I think it is. Wow, yeah. tremendous. Yeah. So let's bring it together then and try and see where we can we can land things as we begin to wrap things up. But, what difference can knownness make? Yes, it might give us boost, goosebumps. It might um, stretch our uh, intellect a bit as we look at sources. Um, as we come to celebrate Easter this this year, as followers of Jesus, or for those that are inquiring and are asking questions, and maybe there's been a few stumbling blocks along the way, um, and maybe need to think a bit more, what difference do you think this should make? Yeah, I, well, I certainly think we should be taking the claim seriously, you know. Um, but we have three facts here, I think, that we can look at. You know, we know that Jesus' disciples taught that he was raised from the dead. Mm. Um, it was not a legend, as you said. It was, uh, you know, it was taught from the very, very beginning of the oral traditions. Um, we know that, too, that Jesus' disciples taught that the risen Jesus appeared to individuals. He appeared to groups. He appeared to friends and, and foe um we know that they're not hallucinations you know group appearances certainly aren't i think it, it, you know i think most uh medics you know psychologists would say today that group hallucinations just don't happen if, if that did happen it would be more of a miracle than the resurrection itself so mm. um and as an individual when we go back to paul well he's not grieving over jesus is there mm. um if anything he was glad of it uh, so he would have been the last place person that Paul would have expected to see. So, you know, the disciples, you know, they were willing to suffer. They, you know, they endured martyrdom for their preaching. They were not lying about this. Um, we know it's highly unlikely they were not lying because, as we know from history, the liars make for martyrs. So, mm. uh, you know, I, I, I think that Paul and the apostles talk consistently about the death, the, you know, the burial and the resurrection. Um, and I think with this information and the oral tradition, that can go right back to the source. It goes back to, you know, critical scholars suggesting that's one to three years. And, you know, N.T. Wright, uh, and I will quote N.T. Wright, you know, he goes on to say that, you know, that is why as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. So I think we have to take these, these claims seriously. And, and the difference that can make, well... For me, when I became a Christian, it changed my life completely. Mm. You know, um, I, you know, I became more aware of things of what I was doing. You know, I, I felt like I'd become a better person. I felt freer as a person. Um, so, you know, this can really transform someone's life if they can, mm. you know, if they can really look at this and, and look at the evidence and see that, you know, even if it's at least plausible um, that, that Jesus did really rise from the dead and that he was who he claimed to be. And that can be a game changer for everyone. Yeah. yeah, that's tremendous. Thank you so much, Rob. I think that hope, note of hope that you just land on is so needed in, in our times, isn't it? And yeah. maybe that's true for those that are followers of Jesus. They've been given a bit of extra grounding and um, the, the, the living hope of the good news of Jesus. And for maybe those that are listening that are a bit more sceptical or unsure, um, I would, yeah, we would certainly encourage you to seriously consider this claim. Mm. and see the impact on a life lived in the hope of one that has power over death has defeated death and has risen from dead the dead um so just any final takeaways before we round things off for this bonus episode yeah i'll probably just um just add on, <coughs> on what i just said there and um, because i think i i, I really feel for, for atheists and, and people that are skeptical because i've been in that position where I've stumbled over questions. I've not been able to find those answers and it can really become a stumbling block for you. Um, and, you know, 
I think one thing we can be reassured of is that even if we do have these questions, you know, whether it's evil and suffering, whether it's, you know, morality or, uh, you know, we're not sure about the creation account, you know, even if these questions remain unanswered, the great thing about the resurrection is irrespective of what objections you may have to Christianity, if Jesus really did rise from the dead, then Christianity is true, irrespective. End of. What a tremendous note to finish with. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, uh, that gives us plenty of food for thought this Easter. I uh, hope you've enjoyed being with us and listening today on at Postcards from Antioch. This bonus episode, Series 5, will be out um, in a number of months, so do watch out for that. And until then, happy Easter, have a good spring-summer, and we will see you again soon. 